So moving on past fossils and what they tell us about human evolution, uh, here we have a, a section talking about genetics and what our studies of molecular genetics tell us about our evolution and history. So for example, the, uh, of course, DNA degrades over time, but even so we have uh, fossils that have recovered DNA uh, as old as 430,000 years. And that was collected from a, a fossil in a cave in Spain. Turns out looking at that uh, genetic uh, sequence, that particular individual, was most closely related to Neanderthals. Uh, more recently, a single finger bone uh, was uh, retrieved, a fossil, from a cave in Denosova, Siberia. And uh, there's an image of that in the upper right um, corner here, at least of the region there in Siberia. And um, that particular DNA uh, suggested it belonged to a new lineage uh, previously unknown to scientists, a uh, new lineage of hominids. And uh, that genetically distinct lineage was called the Denos Den Denisovans. Let me... So of course we've been looking at uh, uh, human history, hominin history from the perspective of fossils, but as with other species, our genes carry uh, our history, and we can learn much from our human history, the evolution of humans through the study of genetics. Uh, in fact, the oldest hominin DNA discovered thus far is about 430,000 years old. That was collected from a specimen in a cave in Spain, and it turns out, you know, based on comparisons, that individual is most closely related to Neanderthals. More recently, a uh, finger bone was collected from a uh, cave in Donisova, Siberia, and since then, some teeth have also been collected and analyzed uh, from that cave. Uh, but the DNA was isolated from those uh, structures, and the sequence of that DNA uh, showed that it uh, belonged to a lineage of hominins uh, that was unknown to us previously. So we've called that lineage the Denisovans after that uh, region called Donisivo. Uh, fossils and DNA both uh, integrated, uh, help to show us and suggest migratory paths for humans. And we can see from the evidence that humans have had two major waves of dispersal out of Africa and into other regions, uh, most especially Europe and Asia, uh, Indonesia. Uh, the second wave, um, eventually led to our dispersal to North and South America, as you can see from the figure at the bottom of this slide. Another perspective, another point that's been discovered by looking at uh, DNA of humans uh, in terms of our uh, molecular evolution, is that uh, there's much greater genetic diversity within and among African populations of humans as compared to European, Asian, North American populations of humans. And that's just simply because uh, those populations of humans in Africa are much older. Um, and the waves of humans that came out of Africa represented small little subsets of populations with less genetic diversity. So if we want to tap into genetic diversity of humans, um, go to Africa. Now, we also know that at least six hominin lineages existed over the past 300,000 years, um, including our own. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if I remember them all off the top of my head now, but we had Homo erectus, Homo floresiensis, um, Homo... Uh, uh, N Naleda, um, the Denisovans, uh, the Neanderthals. Uh, I know I'm leaving somebody out here. I'm trying to remember them all. 
but our genetics also shows that uh, we've got evidence of hybridization between several of these lineages. Uh, no surprise, uh, hybridization is common among closely related lineages. I didn't include that figure here on the slide that uh, is sort of a cladogram looking figure of these uh, six um, lineages and it shows the uh, introgression, the spread of uh, DNA between them in that figure. Now, of course, out of these uh, six lineages, uh, five of them went extinct. Uh, we're the only one remaining, Homo sapiens. So why are we the last one standing? Why did the other lineages of hominins go extinct? Well, we don't know exactly, but two main hypotheses include the effects of climate change, uh, and how that climate change affected habitat that humans lived in during the Ice Ages. Perhaps we just simply could not um, adapt, if you will, to those changing habitats. Another is interspecific competition, um, tapping into our community ecology theory of um, competitive exclusion, you know, Gauss's theory of competitive exclusion. No two species can occupy the same niche uh, well, many species have niche overlap. They don't have exactly the same niche, but they overlap. Certainly, our various lineages of hominins would have experienced significant niche overlap. And perhaps we just simply outcompeted them, maybe killed them off. So we saw earlier in our sections that uh, bipedalism was a big anatomical uh, feature of early hominins that evolved with various uh, fits and spurts of uh, evolution uh, coming in from Ardipithic, Ardipithecus into Australopithecus and so on, increased bipedality. Uh, but we also uh, saw when we uh, reached the genus Homo, like Homo habilis, uh, one of the earliest um, species of Homo, that our brain sizes began to get bigger, uh, jumping from 400 cubic centimeters up to 600 cubic centimeters in Homo habilis. Uh, and then from there, increased brain size in Homo erectus and uh, other species of Homo. So, uh, you could think of um, at least our more recent uh, hominins as being big-brained, tool-making, cooperative hunter-gatherers uh, who depended upon uh, sophisticated cognition to obtain food and to survive in a range of habitats. So at least for our more modern hominins, our genus Homo, that's probably a realistic way to think about us. Big brain, tool making, cooperative hunter-gatherers, sophisticated cognition. Uh, about 40,000 years ago in our own species, we see evidence of cave paintings and uh, um, very specific sculptures of animals uh, carved by uh, humans showing a sophisticated expression. Indeed, human brains have tripled in size over just the past three million years. Um, as I just mentioned a little bit ago, from 400 cubic centimeters uh, to 1,200 and higher cubic centimeters in Homo sapiens and in Neanderthals. We, in fact, have the largest brain relative to body size for any animal. Uh, if you look at figure 17.34, which I inserted at the bottom right of the slide, um, you can see graphically the uh, increase in endocranial volume over the past few million years and how it has increased looks exponential uh, to our modern levels. So, of course, as mentioned earlier, that our big brains require a huge investment of energy relative to other tissues. And as mentioned earlier, our ability to hunt uh, and to process food probably was a key feature that allowed our brains to evolve and get bigger.
Um, we have evidence of directional selection in some lineages of humans, and we have evidence that it's just genetic drift in others. So those key mechanisms we've covered at various times in this class do help explain the expansive size of brains in various hominins. Uh, indeed, a recent research, uh, we're talking just the past few years really, suggests selection for ecological intelligence, that is, our ability to make tools and to process food with those tools. So recent research suggests that um, our you know, natural selection was favoring ecological intelligence over social intelligence. Uh, and, then, and then finally, the last point here in terms of our, our brains, our evolving human brains, uh, we have a region of the brain that's not unique to us humans. We can find it in chimps, other primates called the arcuate fasciculus. And we have uh, very, very high numbers of connections in this region of the brain, uh, much higher than what's found in chimps. And even what chimps have is higher than in other primates. Um, this region of the brain is essential to language. And of course, language is, is a hallmark thing of us as homo sapiens. So we don't know where in the hominid lineage this occurred, these increased connections. We just know that it has occurred. Um, it might be something that would be difficult to, for us to ascertain. But given that uh, we you know, speculate that or hypothesize that language is a relatively recent phenomenon in, in Homo, then uh, perhaps uh, the expansion of that region is similarly a relatively recent phenomenon. We're being focused on our brains uh, and brain evolution. You know, humans appear to be unique compared to other animals, including our closest relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos, in our ability to use sounds and gestures and symbols, all of which are part of our language. Um, this language ability allows us to understand abstract concepts. Yeah, other species, chimps and bonobos and etc., do communicate. We might say they have a very simple form of language, but ours is much more complex. And we, uh, our language allows us to understand and share abstract concepts, such as making complex plans, for example gaining a deep understanding of others, inner lives, how what they think, what they do, how they feel, and even to teach new concepts and new understandings, uniquely human, goes along with our brains. Uh, we're born uh, with the ability to learn syntax. Syntax is the rules of language. So we have an innate ability to learn the rules of language. There are over 6,000 different languages around the world uh, in our species, and uh, they all have rules of syntax, and we are all born into this world as humans able to learn those rules of syntax. Now, different areas of our brain are activated for listening to speech, listening to others, as compared to hearing just ordinary everyday sounds like the song of a bird or something falling, etc. Um, so again, humans are a little bit different, a little bit unique in being able to listen and hear speech as compared to other animals, especially our close relatives. Now, evidence suggests that language is an adaptation shaped by natural selection. For example, um, we have very precise control of our sound-making ability uh, because of our larynx. Uh, we have a larynx that is much more complexly developed than a chimp or bonobo.
Um, and we also can learn new vocal patterns and we can use them in almost infinite combinations following the rules of syntax. We're constantly coming up with new words, new ways of expression. They're all falling into our rules of syntax, but because we have this innate ability to do this, our power of language is incredible. So, but the bottom line at the end of this is that the genetics of language is only beginning to be understood. We're just barely starting to get uh, to an understanding of genetically what controls language. Almost certainly modifications of our brain uh, may have made language possible. And uh, we're just at the cutting edge of um, figuring out just how that has happened. You know, and, and, and sometimes uh, I've gotten the question uh, over the years, you know, are humans still evolving? Um, this is a question I think a lot of people have who, you know, accept a biological evolution. Uh, as a fact that it happens and it has happened and I, I think it's uh, natural for us to wonder well are we still evolving or we stop evolving well there's ample evidence that humans have been evolving uh, up to recent times and there's evidence that humans are continuing to evolve in the 21st century but the, the first example given here is one that we skipped over in an earlier chapter, that chapter that had case studies on natural selection. Uh, we didn't cover that chapter, but one of the case studies was about the evolution of lactose tolerance and um, how humans keep the gene uh, for making lactase uh, activated past uh, infanthood, you know, into adulthood, so we can keep digesting lactose as a food source. And it was discussed in that uh, earlier chapter how mutations, there were actually a few independent mutations that occurred uh, in her, uh, herders in North Africa, Southern Europe. Um, who were herding cattle and had access to milk as food. And because they had access to that food source, milk, and were using it, um, those mutations were selected for. So um, selection and drift have continued to operate on local human populations uh, up to the present, um, including with uh, lactase uh, evolution. Um, now, interestingly, the farther a population is from Africa, the lower its allelic diversity is. Um, and presumably, this is from founder effects, as humans have dispersed from Africa and gone to new regions. There uh, would have been small groups of humans migrating to these places and uh, they would have experienced a founder effect like any other species, only carrying a small segment of genetic diversity from the source, which was Africa, where the main body of our genetic diversity is. And then once these populations became established in other parts of the world, be it you know Europe, Asia, um, Indonesia, uh, etc., then the bottleneck effect could also reduce the amount of genetic variation in those populations. So those evolutionary mechanisms indeed help us to understand why there is less genetic variation in populations outside of Europe, uh, Africa, excuse me. Uh, the figure on the right side of the slide here is showing you in graphical form how the farther the distance is from specifically uh, Ethiopia, the less genetic diversity there is in human populations. Now, populations around the world also retain evidence of past introgression from migrants. That is, as humans have uh, experienced waves of migration and come into contact with established populations, they, of course, would have mated, reproduced, 
and left behind that genetic evidence of mating, of introgression. So we can see that in the examination of human genetics around the world. And um, yeah, so the bottom, the bottom figure there on the bottom left is uh, pointing out that the genetic structure of European populations very precisely reflects their geography. Uh, this is going to a broader point on this slide and on this part of the chapter that uh, once established, human populations don't tend to move very much. You may get a few individuals leaving and migrating to a new area, but people tend to stay put. And that's what's happened in Europe is uh, populations have tended to homogeneously stay together and interbreed together uh, such that um, very much so uh, genetic structure of European populations reflects their geography. And, um, you know, this is indeed the basis of the many consumer tests that are out there for our ancestry. Like, hey, get my DNA tested and, and see what it uh, tells me about where in the world my ancestors were from. This is the basis of those genetic tests right here. So, you know, again, in the sections that, that um, I reviewed in part one and part two, they were very heavy on looking at the fossil record of early human evolution and then homo evolution. And that fossil record reveals the effects of natural selection on hominin evolution. We can see the effects of natural selection towards becoming more bipedal. Uh, we can see the effects of natural selection on our brain size. Um, well, DNA, not fossils, but DNA allows us to inspect selection at the molecular level. I was mentioning on the past slide about um, the, uh, I didn't mention the LCT allele, but the allele uh, alleles for lactase persistence. And of course, as you know, mentioned, and then it was discussed in the earlier chapter, uh, case studies of natural selection, um, those originated in areas of cattle herding. Um, now, the preponderance of this allele in Europe was actually brought to Europe by nomads in the Near East from the Russian steppes about 4,500 years ago. But it took hundreds of years to increase in frequency. If you check out figure 17.39, which is on the right-hand side of this uh, slide, it uh, is showing you the frequency of um, the allele in various populations. And uh, as you get to about 4,500 years ago, we uh, have this second wave of nomads from the Near East and uh, bringing uh, this allele, and but it took hundreds of years after that that wave of migration um, and dispersal to get the frequency of the allele increasing in Western Europe. Um, but there's been much more going on than just the evolution of um, lactase persistence. The figure at the bottom of the slide is showing numerous examples of relatively recent evolution by natural selection on human populations around the world. Um, and all of these, of course, are, are happening according to the local environmental conditions. Uh, so some regions have favored uh, uh, diets higher in fat. Um, that would be like populations at very north latitudes in the Arctic that are feeding on lots of blubber, um, harvesting animals from the ocean. Um, starchy foods have been selected in some areas, and alleles favoring the metabolism of starchy foods are higher in some regions. Skin pigmentation, you know, uh, is highlighted in... Uh, um, Central Europe. Of course, malaria is a classic example. Malarial resistance in Africa. Um, adaptations in um, Western South America and the Andes to living at high altitudes. So there's been numerous examples of natural selection 
acting on Homo sapien populations over the past 40,000 or less years and directing our evolution. Again, similar to what we see and what we expect in other species. So getting towards the end of this chapter here, we're focusing uh, on emotions as evolutionary legacies um, and the um, aspects of reward and addiction that humans uh, respond to. So, you know, humans may be unique in using reason and planning ahead and in using language, but we still share profound similarities with other animals. You know, our vast amount of ancestry is going back millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years with other animals. And that explains, you know, a lot about us. There's really just a fraction of us that's recent and uniquely human. And like we've been going over, a lot of that has to do with our big brains. The amygdala is a region of our brain shared with mammals going back well past 100 million years ago. And it's uh, related, for example, with our fear response, um, fear response in all mammals. So even words such as the word poison or the word danger can activate the amygdala. Um, indeed, some responses uh, to some dangers like snakes, humans seem to be sort of hardwired and mammals in general are hardwired to have a fear of snakes. Natural selection uh, most likely favored that fear, goes tied into our amygdala as a life-saving response in our past ancestors. Then we turn to dopamine here on the slide, you know, dopamine being a, um, a chemical related to elation and pressure, a uh, pleasure, excuse me. It's released in our brain stem in response to pleasurable experiences such as the smell of food can release dopamine, get a pleasure response. Uh, mice have been studied a lot in terms of emotions and uh, um, responses to dopamine or lack of dopamine or extra dopamine. Mice that are deprived of dopamine completely lack motivation, uh, completely disappears. They'll stop searching for food and they'll starve to death. Uh, overdosing on dopamine produces an addiction response. And if mice are injected with uh, high doses of dopamine, they don't stop uh, uh, behaviors that they have been conditioned to um, for that uh, dopamine, like pressing a lever. Even if the lever, you know, stops giving them the reward, giving them food, once they're conditioned to that, when they're injected with lots of dopamine, they'll just keep pressing that lever until they starve to death and die. <laughs> Crazy. Um, and dopamine release can be triggered in humans via behaviors like gambling, for example. Um, hence, one, one reason why people have gambling addictions. It's that dopamine release, a pleasure. Or hearing a joke could cause dopamine release. And so this leads us to the last little comment on this slide and kind of in this section that addictive drugs like cocaine can hijack our brains by releasing abnormally high levels of dopamine for pleasure, and then we can't stop taking those drugs. We have to keep having those drugs. So, you know, the point of this is that our evolutionary legacy of having dopamine as a natural chemical response to pleasure uh, helps to explain many of our modern human behaviors and responses, including addiction. And then as we wrap up here, we can even turn our attention to the bonds that we make uh, with one another between individuals, relationship bonds. So hormones such as oxytocin, vasopressin, have an evolutionary history going back some 600 million years. 
and you can see in the figure here on the slide vasopressin oxytocin these are found in primates like us like gorillas etc and um, but they share a homology with hormones of other animal lineages vasotocin you can see in that figure is found in reptiles amphibians fishes uh, mesotocin, isotocin, and the figure is also showing in bold amino acid sequences that are in common among these various homologous hormones. Um, so oxytocin is released by the hypothalamus in our brains and it's responsible for the bond that forms between mothers and their offspring. So that's a really important hormone in mammals where there is a mother-infant bond after birth. Being deprived of oxytocin severs the bond and a mother could abandon her baby. Being injected with oxytocin triggers bond formation. Uh, so there, again, we're talking about human behavior, specifically here, human emotion. So there's a hormone we share with other species that helps to explain our pair bonding, our bonding with mates, our bonding with our children. Romantic love is a long-term bonding in humans that's relatively unusual and where does this come from because our close relatives don't have such long-term bonding well it very well may have its roots in the uh, need if you will or at least the selective benefit of providing a necessary food for our children so because we have such big brains, because our children require such large amounts of calories to fuel the development of those brains, we need to be able to provide them with that food. Um, by having pair bonds, by having a male and female form a long-term bond, that's going to help ensure that our children have a better chance of acquiring those nutrients and those calories for development. So natural selection may have favored that long-term pair bond that is somewhat unique to humans, at least in our closely related lineage that we're in. Um, various hormone sprays, uh, in fact, can induce behaviors like trust, like forgiveness, empathy and kind of a takeaway message here in terms of application is well these kinds of chemical sprays uh, hormone sprays may be used as psychiatric psychiatric treatments uh, to help people uh, with behavioral issues 